Thanks a lot, Anne. <laughs> <laughs>
And the idea of Wednesday night was is those 200 men did what they could do. And those 400 men did what they could do. And we challenged you through that thought was find your place. God, when he saved you, God has given us all about abilities and talents. And you need to find your place of service and do what you can do for Jesus Christ. That's all you can do. When you stand before the Lord someday, you want him to be able to say, if, he's, if Christ is speaking to God the Father, you want him to be able to look at you and say, listen, based on the circumstances and situations I put them in, and the talents and gifts and abilities I gave them, they did what they could do to the best of their ability. Nothing better can be said about you. Amen. Right. No greater reward will anybody else in heaven receive than what you will receive for doing what you can do for what God gave you. So we finish First Samuel. So what are we going to preach on this morning? Nehemiah chapter 4. What, what would I say to you as my closing thought? Here it is. There's still work to do. There's still work to do. Just because Pastor Phillips leaves and Pastor Farland takes over, the work is the same. There's still work to do. I would be a fool to stand here and go, well, we got it all done. We haven't scratched the surface. We still need to roll up our sleeves and get to the task that God has put before us. There is still a work to do. The book of Nehemiah is a great book. It's a great book on leadership. It's a great book on how to deal with people. It's a great book on dealing with opposition, much that we encounter in our life as Christians. But the thrust of the book is about rebuilding the walls around the city of Jerusalem. When Jerusalem was conquered, 70 plus years earlier, when they came through, they just destroyed the city, tore the walls down, just wiped the place out, destroyed the temple. And of course, a, a group had come back and eventually rebuilt the temple, but they had not rebuilt the walls. And so there was no protection for the people, and it was a tough time for them. So Nehemiah comes on the scene, and he heads up the rebuilding project, rebuilding the walls around the city of Jerusalem. Now, chapter 4 is an interesting chapter. It's called the work chapter. Now, in the entire book of Nehemiah, you find the word work 19 times. Now, I know that's a cuss word today, but it's a good Bible word, work, amen? In case you have forgotten something I may have said in the last 20 plus years, when Adam was in the garden, what did he do? Work. work. And when you and I come back with Jesus Christ, what are we going to do? Work. So guess what you do in between? Work. You work. We're workers. Workers. And so it's mentioned the word work is 19 times in the book of Nehemiah, but in chapter 4, the word work is found seven times. Of those 19, seven times in chapter 4. And so we have a seven point message based on those seven times the word shows up in this chapter. I'll give you a chance to recover the shock of seven points. <laughs> You don't have to beat anybody to the restaurant today because the restaurant's right over there, amen? So, now there's several categories of people here this morning. I don't know which category you fall into. There are those that maybe are here this morning and they're unsaved and they're visiting the services. Maybe they're here because they have contact with me. Maybe this is the day they decide to visit Victory Baptist Church, but they're here and unsaved. There are those who may be here this morning, you're saved, and maybe you've only been saved for a little while, or you're saved, but you've never really done much for Christ. The third group would be those that are saved, and they have been living for Christ. You might say living a life of devotion to the Lord for many years. But there's, no matter which group you fall into, there's one thing we all have in common. So well, what is that? We are all the result of someone's work. That's right, that's right. We are all the result of someone's work. We are the result of labor that somebody has done for the Lord. Now, people who didn't witness, and people who don't speak up for the Lord, they didn't have they didn't have any involvement in leading you and I to the Lord or bringing us to where we are today. The people who didn't give up of their free time to serve Jesus Christ played no part in you and I being in church today and serving the Lord today. Someone taught you Bible with time they forfeited for God and for you. And it took time to they gave up this, they gave up that to study, to prepare. Teach you the word of God each and every week. 
Whoever taught you how to sing praises to the Lord. Whoever taught you how to live for Jesus Christ. Whoever showed you how you should separate yourself from the world and separate yourself from sin and unto righteousness and unto the Lord. All those people, as you look back over your life, bestowed work on you for God. And so every one of us today is a beneficiary of someone's sacrificial work for the Lord. And that's a great blessing. It's a great blessing. You and I are the result of someone's work. And so I want to first dispel the myth that working for God in this day and age is ridiculous. And that this in this day and age doesn't do me good. That trying to labor for the Lord on behalf of souls or to teach Christians how to live for the Lord is a waste of time. You say, well, why are you, why are you saying that's not true? Because all of us sitting here today argue against that argument. All of us this morning are a testimony that that criticism is invalid because the work and labor someone bestowed upon us truly did pay off, truly was worthwhile. And the proof is sitting here this morning. The proof is our own lives. So this morning I'm going to ask you as we look at this message that there's still work to do. I don't want you to think of this as a sermon on working for God in terms of those outside the four walls of this building this morning or whether or not it's worth your time or effort to do for Jesus Christ. What I want you to do is just take a moment and be selfish. Be selfish for just a moment and, a moment and look at yourself and say, look at, my, look at me. I know, you're shocked I said that, right? Look at me. Look at my life. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. I have eternal life because somebody worked for the Lord. Amen. Right. Hey, this morning, look at my life. I'm sitting in a Bible-believing church. I'm enjoying the benefits of Christianity in my life. I'm enjoying the benefits of truth of the Word of God in my life. Why? Because somebody worked for God in my life. And it's made an eternal difference. Amen. So all of us would agree this morning that it is beneficial and it is worthwhile to do work for God and to labor for the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to take the next few minutes and I'm going to look at seven truths about the word work found in Nehemiah chapter 4. Let's pray and then we'll come back and do that. Lord, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here this morning. I pray that you would help us, Lord, with attentive hearts, receptive hearts, Lord, to hear the message. To hear my burden, my desire, my plea for Victory Baptist Church. Lord, we won't see this as a scary time, as a time of uncertainty. It's not that. We have seen your hand in all of this. We have seen how you have prepared and what you have done. Lord, uh, change does bring uncertainty sometimes. We can go on and on about that. We've seen your work. We've testified to that. The men have spoken on that. And I pray that you help us to see this morning that amidst all of this, Lord, as we give you honor, Lord, for what you have done, which you've allowed us as a family to do here at Victory these years. Lord, I pray for uh, a double blessing on Pastor McFarland and his family. As they had to lead this church forward. It's a time, Lord, to roll our sleeves again. It's a time to get busy with the cause of Christ again. Because there's still work to be done. And I pray that you help us to see that truth this morning in Scripture and how to go about that work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1 says, But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we built the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. Can I say, isn't that a great and amazing picture of the world today? They get mad that you come to church. They get mad that you believe... This Bible is the Word of God. They get mad that you protect your children. May give them a Christian education. Bring them to Sunday school. Now, can I ask you something? What business is it of theirs? Right. Right. What we do with our families. What business was it of saying about it? What the Jews did. Don't have a right to protect themselves. Don't have a right to do as the Lord leads. Right. Let's keep going. And he spake before his brother in the army of Samaria. And said, what do these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make it in, the, in a day? Will they revive and store up the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? 
Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him. He said, Even that which they built, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. They're mocking them and making fun of them. I tell you what, Israel, the nation of Israel has done more for that land over there than anybody else has ever done. Right, amen. So that's not politically correct, but it's biblically correct. Sure. Biblically correct. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Nehemiah says here, turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. And cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee. For they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. Here we go. Here comes our first time of the word work, verse 6. So built we the wall, and the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. For the people had a mind to what? Work. To work. A mind to work. And the Bible says, first off in verse 6, so built we the wall. You know what that is? No that shows. Now you see what they're what they're dealing with. They're dealing with conflict. They're dealing with opposition. They're dealing with being mocked. But yet we find persistency with God's people. So we He just told you what's been going on, and he says, So we built the wall. Now let me just point out a few things here. This is probably the biggest point of the seven. Listen, anybody could have built the wall. It'd been lying in ruins for years, as best we can understand from reading the Bible. It has been at least 12 years since the first group of Israelites have come back to the land as freed men and women. And though all those years have passed, the wall still lies in ruin. It wasn't a lack of ability as to why the wall had not already been rebuilt. It wasn't a lack of strength as to why the wall had not been rebuilt. It wasn't because the government had forbidden the rebuilding of the wall. And the Bible says in verse 6, it says, And the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. So that shows us that they have been making progress. Uh, it means that the wall is probably is connected and it's about halfway the height of what it's supposed to be. So they have made some progress. There's not one place where the wall doesn't, uh, doesn't touch wall. It's half as high as it's going to be. And they've done that in just a short amount of time. So what made the difference from the previous 12 years at this point where Nehemiah has showed up on the scene and now the work is being done. Well, the difference wasn't liberty. The difference wasn't freedom because they already had that. They were free. The difference wasn't strength and wasn't ability because they already had strength and ability. It wasn't funding or finances because they had that as well. The difference was this. The people had a mind Amen. to work. That's it. That's what made the difference. They had a mind. That means they had a passion to get that wall built. They had a heart for it. They had a mind to the work. So let me just say this morning, you sitting here, especially if you're saved, God can use you or God can never use you. The choice is up to you. God can use you or He can never use you. See, because it's up to you. It's up to you to make up your mind to work for God. Listen, He's already given you the talent. He's already given you the ability. He's already given you the opportunity. The question is, is, do you have a mind to work for God? People get saved. Some get right in. Some don't. People get saved. But somewhere along the line, after someone is saved, they realize how good God has been to them. They realize the blessings of God in their life. And they begin to look around and realize that there's a great need in the community. And all of a sudden, they get it in their mind. I'm going to do something for God. Now, they didn't suddenly become able to do something for God. They've always been able. They didn't suddenly have the opportunity to do something for God. They've always had the opportunity. They just all of a sudden adjusted their way of thinking. And changed their way of thinking. Decided they were going to do something for God. Now, Nehemiah was the leader. He helped with that. But listen, he couldn't force them to work. Amen. All he could do was encourage them to work. He couldn't compel them to work, but he could encourage them. And when these people made up their mind that said, hey, you know what? These, these stones have laid on the ground long enough. The, this destruction, this wall has gone on long enough. And when they said, hey, enough is enough. We're going to start stacking these stones the way they need to be stacked. We're going to start putting them back in the place they need to be. And when they decided, hey, we're going to repair the wall, guess what they discovered? They had the muscle to do it. They had the skill to do it. They had the know-how to do it. 
They had the leadership to do it. They had the safety to get it done. But none of that came about, and none of that was done until they made up their mind to do something for the Lord. Right. So here we are at Victory Baptist Church, May 21st, 2017. Listen, no one here is compelled, beaten, <laughs> whipped to give out gospel tracts. No one here is compelled to speak to their neighbor about Jesus Christ. No one here is compelled, forced to teach Sunday school, work in the nursing, uh, work in the nursery, serve in some ministry. No one's compelled to do those things. But the preacher does get up as he is today. And he has on a regular basis for years and years. He says, look, look at what needs to be done. Consider what part you can have in getting that work done. And the preaching goes out and some of it just falls on the ground. But some of it makes its way to the hearts of individuals, into the heart of a man, into the heart of a woman, who says, you know what? I'm determined. I'm going to do something for the Lord. I have made up my mind. And every work that is done in this church or any other church is done by people who always have the ability, but at some point make up their mind to get to work. All the work that's in, that is done in this church or some other church is done by people who had been gifted. Because as we saw Wednesday night, when you're saved, God distributes those gifts as it pleases Him. But at some point in their life, your life, my life, we said, you know what? I can do something for God. I can do something for Jesus Christ. Now listen, it can be a simple thing. Because when people say work for Jesus, I don't know why we all think we're all headed to China. Or Africa. That's not why we think that. I don't know. But it could be a simple thing. You know, how about how about just taking this challenge? If just once a week, I'm going to invite a neighbor to come to church. I'm going to take a neighbor and invite him to come to church. How about once a week, I'm going to invite a loved one to come to church. Just call them up, email them, text them, whatever social media means you want to use to get in touch with them. Hey, once a week, I'm going to invite a co-worker to come to church. See, there is something that every one of us could do for God in the work of God. It's not a lack of liberty. It's not a lack of ability. It's not a lack of gifts. It's not a lack of opportunity that keeps us doing something for God. It's just a failure to make up our mind to do it. Right. You say, well, that really hurts my feelings, Pastor. What? The truth is true. Right. You pay the doctor to tell you the truth. You don't have to give today. Free truth. <laughs> It's just because we don't make up our mind to do it. Now, isn't it amazing what we make up our mind to do? I mean, we have to get up. Well, go to work. Kids, you have to get up and go to school. You have to clean the house. You have to mow the yard. You have to brush your teeth, I hope. You need to get a good night's rest. And I need to do something for Jesus Christ. See, if we would just get it in our mind, that's on the to-do list. And we don't do it to get saved, we're saved. But we have to get it in our mind that we should do for the Lord. We're all able. We just all need to be willing. Amen. We're all able. We just all need to be willing. Number two, look at verse 11. The second time the word work shows up. Well, let's just keep reading the story. I know you want to know what's going on. Verse 7, But it came to pass that when Sambalat, Tobiah, and the Arabians, and the Ammonites, and Ashdodites heard the walls of Jerusalem were made up and the breaches began to be stopped. Then they were very wrong. They conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God. I like that. He might not panic. He didn't fret. He prayed. And set a watch against them day and night because of it. And Judas said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. And there is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work, that's our second time, to cease. Number two this morning, adversaries will keep you from working. Adversaries will keep you from working. As soon as somebody decides to do something for the Lord, the Bible says, and our adversaries say, listen, there is always adversity. Anytime you make up your mind, you're here this morning, you say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something for the Lord. You're going to have an adversary. Right. It's going to happen. There's always adversity. Listen, do you want to do something for Jesus Christ? Do you want to do a work for Him? Listen, somebody is going to laugh at you. Y'all been laughing at me for years, ain't it? 
Now, I give you a reason, but you know what? But if you do something for the Lord, people are going to laugh at you. Listen, if you do something for the Lord, people will ridicule you. If you do something for the Lord, they're going to criticize you. They're going to find fault with how you do it. And people are going to tell you that you're wasting your time. And my response is, so what? So what? The adversary says there, it says, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm glad I live in America. Notice that if you work in the United States or you live in the United States of America, notice the things I said there. They'll laugh at you, ridicule you, criticize you, criticize you, find fault with how you do. But notice I didn't mention anything in here about they'll kill you. Amen. Uh, but in this chapter, they said, we're gonna, we don't like the work they're doing. We're going to go in there and do what? Kill them. We're going to kill them. I live in a country where I, with what I do for Christ, that's not on the list, get killed. Amen? Now that could change in the future, but it's not on the list right now. These people in, in Jerusalem woke up and said, hey, we're going to do something for the Lord today. And they had people say, oh yeah, well, we're going to kill you for doing that work. You and I don't face that this morning. Our Sunday school teachers got up this morning, they got in their cars, and they drove and taught Sunday school, and it never crossed their mind that they might be killed for teaching Sunday school. Amen. We go out on Saturday, Saturation Saturday, and knock on doors, hand out invitations, invite folks to come to church, and they have an opportunity to share the gospel with them. But when we gather together, we don't pray, Dear Lord, I help no one to kill us today. Now, we might pray, Lord, we hope no one cusses at us today. We hope no one slams a door in our face today. Lord, we hope most people are receptive to what we have to say, but we're not worried about being killed. And so these people here in chapter 4 made up their mind that even though there was serious opposition, they were going to do a work for God. And so here's what you and I need to understand. We need to get over the idea that that I'm going to go to work for the Lord without being criticized. You're going to be criticized. I'm, you're not going to go to work for the Lord and someone's not going to find fault with you. You're not going to be working for the Lord and someone not tell you that you're wasting your life and wasting your time. It's going to happen. We already know that. You need to understand that. But isn't it worth working for God with whatever opposition or criticism someone may throw your way? Isn't it worth that? Listen, you'll take a beating for your sports team. Years and years ago, we are New England Patriot fans. Sorry. But before they ever won their big Super Bowls and all that, um, my mom gets me Sports Illustrated. My parents do every year. And one of the years, if you signed up for Sports Illustrated, you got a sweatshirt. And it just happened to be a New England Patriot sweatshirt. And so like in 2000 or 01, I've gone over here to the gas station, and I got some gas, and, you know, and the testing of your faith that didn't print the receipt. You know, that kind of thing. Now you got to go inside. So I go inside to get the receipt. Not only do I, am I being tested about that, someone goes, that's a Luther team. And what could I say? They were. <laughs> but, but I like the New England Patriots. And then next year they won the Super Bowl and, and now the whole thing's turned around. But we'll take a beating for our team. We'll take a beating for, hey, you know, whether you, you we know, the uh, Ford fans, and then there's Chevy fans. And then there's this, I'm glad my car runs fans, amen? <laughs> but some of you will take a beating over your brand of automobile. And if we're willing to do that, that's not even worth it. But taking criticism and ridicule for the cause of Christ is worth it. And it's worth it for eternity. Listen, when you see the news, we've got people who are standing for Christ and they're being burned alive in cages. People are having their throat slit because they won't honor a dead prophet. And we want to talk about getting laughed at. We want to get talked about someone closing a door in our face. We want to talk about someone ridiculing us. See, I'm not making light. Because here's the reason why. We all kind of love ourselves. And we want everyone to think highly of us, as we do. And when we get ridiculed, people criticize us and find fault with it. Listen, it stings a little bit. Years ago, Levi and I were out. I think we were doing a vacation Bible school blitz. I'm not for sure, but he was my partner. He was this little guy. And we were going through the neighborhood. I know exactly where it was. And we're going house to house. 
And they came up to this guy's house. They kind of had a long driveway. He was outside the garage. And it's about 7.30 that evening. And I got a little guy with me. We're getting ready to go up the driveway. And he's like, get out of my the property. I said, oh, I'm just, oh, wait, wait. And what I want to do is, son, you go hide for a minute. I'm going to share Jesus with this guy. Oh, <laughs> Man, I was hot. Cussing like that in front of my son. We weren't doing anything. We weren't selling anything. Just trying to, you know what? It took off. Now I'm saying, we'll come back later and share Jesus with him. I'm really not. You know. If he had ever got saved, that scene I just told you about is going to play out in his mind for eternity. Yes, sir. Well, Lord, you never... Oh, I sent a man and his son, and you cussed him out, wouldn't let him up, you'd come up your driveway. That was your opportunity. And you rejected it. Right. But you know what? We need to make sure they have the opportunity right. to remember that someone tried to bring the gospel to them. Someone tried to tell them about Jesus Christ. You know, and we kind of, and it's just our flesh, we cower back. Oh, I don't want to be criticized. Listen, people criticize you for the clothes you wear. Some of you are in shock. Hey, people criticize you for the car you drive. They criticize you for your accent. They criticize you for your hairstyle. They'll criticize you for your skin color. Listen, you can't live in this world without being criticized. Amen. You can't live in this world without being ridiculed. You say, well, listen, some of you, you have no trouble. You'll, you'll see someone on Facebook and you'll spout your opinion. And boom, you get blasted for it, don't you? You're still on Facebook. Amen. How, you know, how dare you voice your opinion to be contrary to what I believe. I'm going to tell you all about it. But you get criticized, you can take those criticisms. But we want to, we got, it, it's, it's worth it for Christ to receive that. I mean, if you're going to get criticized, get criticized for doing something for Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I started witnessing preacher, and people made fun of me. He was making fun of you since kindergarten. Amen. I know that's why I'm in therapy today. No, you just need to get out and do something for the Lord. People make fun of you. That's the, what's the big deal? Listen, some of you, oh, listen. How many of you, don't raise your hand. Oh, boy. But, you know, we're going to go shopping. And we go along. And, and then we sit in the mall and we people watch. Now, what are you, what are you really doing? You and your son or whoever's with you or just you talking to yourself are making fun of the way people look. You know it. Did she see that before she left the house? What was she thinking? What is wrong with him? And on we go. It just, it just happens, amen? So just get over it and go out and do something for the Lord. All right, let's keep going. Verse 11, verse uh, 12. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times from all places when she shall return unto us, they will be upon you. They're going to attack us. They're going to kill us. Therefore, he says, set I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places. I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, uh, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. Fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your houses. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to not that we return all, all, all of us to the wall and everyone unto his work. Number three, everyone did his work. It wasn't one person here, two people over here. So how did they get that wall built so quick? How did they get that wall built in 52 days? They, everyone did their work. Do you know when the wall went up? And you know why it went up in a short time? Because everyone did his work. Everyone didn't watch the other one do the other one's work. Everyone didn't tell the other one how the work should be done. Everyone said, what can I do? Where can I plug in? Is there a spot for me? Listen, that is music to the ear of a pastor. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And that's what happened here. So well, there's nothing for me to do. No. There's 
always something for you to do. When's the last time you came to the pastor and said, plug me in, put me wherever you need me, whatever it may be? See, that's a mind, it goes back to our first point, that's a mind to work. You can do something for the Lord. You don't have to be a missionary, you don't have to be a preacher, you don't have to be in full-time evangelism. You could serve one Sunday a month in the nursery. You could assist in a Sunday school class. You could clean the church. You could pick up paper. You could back up. You could sort the track rack. You could hand out bulletins. Listen, the work on that wall in the city of Jerusalem got done because everyone went to his work. And when everybody did their job, the whole project got done. Got done. Number four. Number four. Look at verse 16. And it came to pass... From that time forth, that half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears and shields and the bows and the habergeons, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. He said, everybody went to work. He said, half were doing this, the other half were holding spears. And so I put number four, according to verse 16, is everyone can assist, can assist in the work. When, they, when the Jews realized that, listen, these people are trying to kill us, they divide the work up. And while half were doing the work on the wall, the other half were holding spears and shields and swords. And they're keeping an eye out so someone doesn't come along and sneak up on them and kill them. Now, you and I would agree that is important, right? That was an important job, yes, somewhat. And so while these guys are putting the stones up and putting mortar in between the stones, the other ones are standing there ready to protect well, you know, Pastor, I just don't like to go out there and do something for the Lord because, well, I'm a new Christian, or I've never done it before. I'm going to give you a simple illustration. Now, I know some of you know, oh, guilt tripping us. No, I'm trying to help you think outside the box. Let's just say we have 10 people go out on Saturation Saturday. 10 people who have no problem knocking on a door, hanging out, a, hanging out an invitation, have no problem talking to people. But we don't like to send people out by themselves. So we have 10 people who are confident to do something for the Lord. They can speak for Christ. But if, when they go out, we put them in pairs of two. So we have ten people, but we only have five pairs knocking on doors. Correct? Now what if we had ten more people who are afraid to speak? You're afraid of your shadow. But if you came and we pitched you, we paired you with the ten who have no problem, you don't have to say a word. They're going to knock on the door. They're going to hand out the They're going to do the talking. Now the people may be wondering what you're doing there as you stand there. You know, but your job is to be praying. See, we can all do that. Right. Oh, Lord, Lord, please don't let this person cuss us out. Oh, please, Lord, help, right. me. help us to receive the invitation. You can also be looking out for dogs. Amen. Make sure no dogs can come up and attack. Uh, you can watch for, you know, you can look at the kids peeking through the window. They're all looking, what are they doing here? And the, but see, you don't have to say anything. But you can assist in the work. Now, instead of five pairs, we have ten pairs. Amen. Hey, if we've got 20 people who say, hey, I've got no problem knocking on the door. I don't care if someone's rude to me. Okay, now we've got 20 brave people who say, hey, I can talk. That's what God's given me. I can talk. And then we have 20 who can't, but they can assist. It's like you're holding a shield. You're holding a spear. You're the, and then you can walk together and then talk until you get to the next house. And then they knock on the door. And you just assist. Everyone assisted. Everyone was doing what they could. So now we've got 20, now we have 10 pairs out knocking on doors. Right. I mean, I'm sorry, 20, you got 20 pairs out. But you got 20, now you got, now you're knocking, now we can knock off maybe six, seven hundred doors on a Saturday. By just coming together and assisting. And so what you have in this chapter is you have people doing the work side by side with people who are assisting so they can get the work done. You know, we live in a day and age where people come to church, they come to the Sunday morning, what do we call it? Service. Sunday morning service. And they think because they came to church and sat in a pew and left that they served. No, that's, that's not serving. You sat in an air-conditioned building with a padded seat and you listened to someone talk. So that's not service, that's fellowship, that's instruction. What we're talking about this morning is doing more than going to church. We're talking about doing what somebody did They got you in church. We're talking about doing something somebody did that got you in church. We're talking about doing more than being saved. We're talking about doing what somebody did which resulted in what? You being saved. Which resulted in you sitting in the pew this morning. You say, well, preacher, I just don't think I'm ready to do what he is doing. But you can stand with him. You can encourage him. 
Hey, you can talk. You can pray. You can help. That's just simply one laboring with, and, and one standing with their sword. It's one laboring and one standing with a shield. Listen, everybody, and this is my, listen, everybody can have a part. Everybody can have a part in this thing. Two vans sitting out in the parking lot. Someone could drive them. Bring families to church. Bring kids to church. Someone could come once a month and fold Sunday bulletin. Someone could come once a month and fold the Wednesday night prayer bulletin. Someone could help with the teens. Someone could assist in the nursery. Hey, but wouldn't it be great if every Sunday school class had a teacher and an assistant teacher? Everybody can assist in the work. Number five, verse 17. It says, They which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens uh, with those that laid it, every one that one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. I just put number five, verse 17. All hands were on deck. Nehemiah had all the people armed and prepared to fight the enemy. Listen, that's why you come to church, folks. You come to church to send the preaching and teaching the Word of God so you can be equipped to fight the enemy. And so being adequately armed is especially important, not just physically here, as they had a physical and it became a nice spiritual because we do have spiritual warfare every each and every day. You can never be too armed in this area. So all hands were on deck. Number 6, verse 19. Great verse here. We're getting close. Verse 19 says, And I said unto the nobles, and, in, and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large. We are separated from the wall one from another. Notice that phrase, the work is great and large. Let me help you think about something this morning. Number six, the work is great and large. The current population, I looked it up, of the United States of America is just over 325 million people. They say there's one birth every eight seconds, there's one death every 12 seconds, and one international migrant every 33 seconds. Now think about that for just a minute. 325, over 325 million people. Really, we can't even comprehend that. It's a great work. It's a large work. You say, well, there is no way that one church and one group of people could reach over 325 million people. That might be true. But there is a better chance of reaching over 325 million souls if you add yourself to the number Amen. of people who are trying to help get it done, then you just sat around saying, it can't be done. Listen, three, over 325 million people, that's a lot of souls. Right. Souls. The current population of the world is just over 7 billion people. There's not enough missionaries to reach all those people. But one more missionary can help. There's not enough churches to reach all these 7 billion people. There's not enough evangelists to reach 7 billion people. But your part, your part is bound to make it better than if you play no part at all. May the Lord help us not just to see it as large. Oh, it's so large. But help us to see it as a great work and a large work. Now this may upset you this morning, but... Animals have spirits. But you and I have a soul. We have a living soul. Jesus Christ went to the cross and He died for souls. He laid down His life for souls. He died on the cross for you and I. But the focus this morning is not on animals. It's on souls. The focus of Victory Baptist Church is souls. Why do we roll up our sleeves? Why am I saying there's still a work to be done? Because there's still souls that need to be saved. There's still souls that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a large, there are large works out there to save manatees, spotted owls, turtles. You name it, they're doing it. And those are large works, but there's a great work out there. And it's the great work of rescuing souls from eternal damnation. Rescuing souls from hellfire and bringing souls to Lord Jesus Christ. There are a, large, a lot of large works you can be involved in. But God's work is just not large. It's great. It's great. And let's just be honest. You don't even know when an animal goes extinct. If I told you this morning, such and such went extinct, they went wrong. But it had no impact on your life. Amen. Would your life be better if the dodo bird was alive? Some of you didn't know there was a spotted owl. Spotted what? The owl spotted something? No, it has a spot. 
It's, it's, it's just, it's just when, which one is it? The, what pigeon? Carrier pigeon, passenger pigeon, is extinct. Don't fall apart. That's my point. Folks, they're, they're just animals. They're just animals. Unlike animals, though, when a soul is lost, when an animal woman dies without Jesus Christ, that soul does not fade away into oblivion. Oblivion, like evolution says and others say, it's a living soul. A living soul is going to spend eternity somewhere, heaven or hell. And that's why the work of God is not just a large work. It's a great work. It's just not something that should be done. It's something that must be done. If you're going to get involved in a great cause, get involved in the cause of working for Jesus Christ. If you want to volunteer your time, you want to volunteer your money and your labor to a cause, let it be to not just a large cause, let it be to a great cause, the cause of Jesus Christ. And then verse 21 is our last one. We'll just pick up verse 21. It says, So we labored in the work, and half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. I like that phrase. So he didn't say so they. He says we. So we labored in the work. Quick review. People had a mind to work. People had adversaries. Everyone did his work. Everyone assisted. All hands were on deck. The work is great and large. And then he says, so we labored in the work. Let me just begin to close this out and make it personal to you and I. You and I know that there are souls that need to be saved. We know there are people who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we've opened our building up and have Spanish services next door. They need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now if, if, so we labored in the work. So if this is true, listen, let's personalize it. If this is true, then it should, we should be thinking, so let me labor. If these facts are legitimate that I'm giving you this morning, then so let me labor. Let me labor for you, for Lord, as if it's a great work. If you believe it, let me labor. There's some place for you to serve, so let me labor. If there's going to be opposition no matter what you do, let me labor. If there's something that God wants you to do, let me labor. And there may be someone here this morning, you may know some people that are unemployed. They're desperately looking for a job. It's summertime, so kids are getting out of high school. Guess what they're looking for? Summertime jobs. And we know because of the economy, the way it's been for years now, hey, it's not like it used to be. It's hard to find work. And it's hard to find jobs, part-time jobs for our young people. But i got great news for you. You know, and you might even, a step back, you might even go to work for someone you don't even like, but they offered you jobs so you can take it. But right now, this morning, as I'm speaking, there is somebody who will hire you right now. He'll pitch you to work right now. Our great God in heaven, amen. And he will. Listen, you can say, listen, I have no talent, no skill, and no prior training. And God says, no problem. Come on. No problem. Amen. 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 Right now, God is willing to put you to work. He, he's willing to let you work for him. He'll give you a job to do for him. Now, there might not be anybody in town that will hire you, but God will. Say, don't you feel better about yourself already? Right. God, I don't know about it. Oh, God, I don't hire me. Amen. No one in town, you stop sending my resume out to a thousand people. No one was impressed with it. God doesn't require a resume. Right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. There's work for you to do, and He will let you do it. As a matter of fact, I can, I'm not preaching prosperity stuff here, but if you did show that you were a good, faithful, dedicated worker for the Lord, he might just move on somebody's heart to hire you. That's right. Amen. That's true. Now listen, they had adversaries in this chapter. To overcome the enemy, we have adversaries. To overcome the enemy and make progress in the work of the Lord is going to require a whole lot of extra effort and dedication. Extra effort and dedication. Now here's the problem. Extra effort and dedication, extra sacrifice is not real appealing to a lot of saved people. And that's why we're in the condition we're in. What Victory Baptist Church needs to continue to do is roll up your sleeves. Because there's a work to do. There's a work to do. Nehemiah's leadership here is needed. It was needed. And his type of leadership is needed in our churches today. It's just self-unwanted. Because we don't want that type of leadership. Listen, we need to work for Jesus Christ. Yes, it's a large work. 
but it's a great work. That's what you got to remember. It's a great work. Yes, there's opposition, but there's opposition to everything we do. Let's do something for the Lord. May the Lord help us not just to live out our days and coast through life, but may God help us to get busy for Him and have part in this great, large work of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, the only thing that's going to make a difference in the life of people who live in the United States of America is not who the President is, not what Congress does. It's Jesus Christ. Amen. It's Jesus Christ that makes the difference. It's Jesus Christ that gives a person hope. It's Jesus Christ that makes a person a new person. It's Jesus Christ that changes their way of thinking. They need Jesus Christ. They don't need a handout. They don't need help from some higher authority in our country or this world. They need Jesus Christ. And what we've done is we've allowed the devil to blind us to that. And we think if we go and help these large causes... If we give to these causes, then it can help out mankind. Man needs Jesus Christ. And, and we just sit around and do. Jesus Christ made a difference in my dad's life. And because of that, it made a difference in my life. It's made a difference in all our lives. We are the benefit. We have been benefited by someone else's work for God. And we sit on a pew and say, I can't. Aren't you thankful someone didn't say, I can't, and skipped your door? Oh, right. Hey, aren't you thankful someone said, I, I can't give, and you didn't hear that radio broadcast? Hey, aren't you thankful someone said, I can't give, and so the tracks were printed, that you, and you never got the track that you read that led you to Jesus Christ? Hey, aren't you glad someone invested in someone's life, and they got saved, and they came over and talked to you, and invited you to church, and you heard the gospel, and you got saved? Amen, amen, amen. amen. We should return the favor. Right, absolutely. There's still a work to do. I'm not being ugly this morning, but just because Pastor Phillips is leaving, nothing changes. Well, the only thing that changes is the guy behind the pulpit is younger. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> the focus is the same. The goal is the same. Amen. Roll up our sleeve. There's still work to do. There are still people to reach. In Ocoa. Hey, I'm thankful Daniel and his family are here this morning. Just out on Saturation Saturday, Daniel's in his garage. He's having a for a church. Right. Now he's here three weeks in a row. He must be a fanatic. Amen. Yes, Amen. Amen. <laughs> but what if we had never gone out on that Saturday morning? See, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. Let's work for Jesus Christ because it's a great work. Remember, we're laboring together. We're striving. Listen, not against each other, as Pastor McFarland said. We're striving together. We are a team. And we're doing it, listen, not for our glory, but for God's glory. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Verse 33 says, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that many that many may be saved. See, so why do you hand out tracts? Why do we door knock? Why do we open the doors? Why do we preach the gospel? That some may be saved. Amen. Obviously, not everybody's going to come through victory and get saved. But I tell you what, I'm looking at some this morning. You got saved at Victory Baptist Church. You came in this building. The gospel of Jesus Christ was preached. Whether it was me, a guest speaker, the man who was the Sunday school teacher. Holy Spirit spoke to your heart. He said, I need to get saved. And you may have gone, ladies, you might have gone in that room right there. Gentlemen, you may have gone over in this room right here. Someone took a Bible and showed you from Scripture how you could be saved. What Jesus Christ had done for you, you got saved. Amen. And it ought to be within us to go on and do that for others. See souls saved. That some, they may be, at least give them the opportunity. Some don't like the sign in the back that says, have you rejected him again? Every time you come in here, if you're not saved, you're making a decision to receive Christ, reject Christ. But even after you're saved, you're sitting in these pews and God's still working on us. And he's still challenging us. He's saying, listen, where are you going to stand? He's saying, get up and go on. He's saying, find your place. The Holy Spirit said, listen, there's still work to be done. Did they build the wall? Oh, yes, they did. In 52 days, they built that wall around the city of Jerusalem. Was there opposition? Yes, there was opposition. Was it easy? No, it wasn't easy. But Nehemiah and that group of people were victorious. 
How did they get the job done? How did they have such a testimony that even to this day we talk about what Nehemiah and those people did? Three things. They had a heart. They had hearts full of passion. Oh, may God return our passion for Him. They had hearts full of passion. They had hearts willing to work. Willing to work. And they had hearts that believed God. And so may you and I take great hope and encouragement from this true biblical account, this true story. And may we join together, and my challenge to you is that you'll join together with Pastor McFarland to accomplish God's work today in the time to come until God takes us home. Join together. Roll up your sleeves. Say, why, Pastor? Because there's still work to do. But it starts with the first point. You have to have a mind to work. And may God give us that. And everything else will fall in place. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time this morning. Thank you for these thoughts. Obviously, I could have said a lot of things this morning. But this is what you put on my heart. I mean, it would be nice to be able to stand here and say, 25 years, we got it all done. But we didn't. We only got to scratch the surface. This city and surrounding area is growing by leaps and bounds year 2016 in the, in the metro area of Orlando 60,000 people moved in 60,000 there are still souls to reach there are still souls that need to be saved 